just a little background with Creole printing. Um, this company has taken tremendous steps throw over I gotta say at least the last 15 to 20 years it's really came about we're one of the most innovative and one of the largest sing single largest printing companies on the west coast and within the country just for being a single company um, the types of actually let's start off um, the company was founded in 1953 so it's been it's a family-owned company for a little over 60 years um, it's a great I mean, we've done, we started off in a single building off the of Highland by downtown and grew eventually to within seven buildings over there. Finally moved everything over here under this one building. Then we outgrew this building. So we went back to our old buildings. We have a newspaper facility over there on Highland. We also have our um, digital shop. It's one of the largest digital um, printers on the West Coast called Digital Lizard. Um, they do a lot of variable um, printing. And I believe um, we have, we're up to 19 digital presses there and also with another company in Hayden, Idaho of Digital Lizard as well. Everything that comes around, um, actually, let's, everything that um, is over there is eventually moving over here. We're moving our coal set. So you're going to see a lot of transition between the companies right now. Other than our digital shop is still going to be located there. They're growing at such a bigger pace they're taking over our newspaper shop while our newspaper shop's moving in here. So it's going to be really nice. You'll see half of the newspaper press today, but um, and the other half will be here up in July and hopefully full up and fully running. And it's actually going to be larger than it was at the other facility. Um, we use, as you know, printing's kind of died, but what's, you know, over the last since the, because of the internet, especially with newsprint, the oh, quantities, everything's been driven down. But we've kind of tried to make up our own process and our own ways to be innovative. We marry up a lot of our catalogs with variable printing and try to get some um, <coughs> B2B or business to business or direct marketing collateral for people so they get the biggest bang for their buck where they don't have to print the most. Um, you're going to see some of this variable I'll show you out there as well. We bring it in here, do a lot of interior sheets. Maybe the cover might just say, you know, we'll, we'll we use mail houses and everything just to be able to get everything up and going for your covers where we know information on you. Maybe that you went to Gold's Gym. They saw an ad right there, page 43. Well, we're going to say, you know, um, and we're, we're gonna, you, we know you like Gold's Gym. Right on the front cover, built out of four color and everything, it's going to have your name there. Because those presses don't use plates. And it's just one of those things that people really like to hold on to and hold for a while. We'll kind of go through the pre-press area. Any questions you guys have, just let me know. We'll stop and go over whatever you guys feel like you need to know. And then I guess we can start moving into our pre-press area. Once the initial um, estimate's made and then the sale's done, what happened is our customer service, they will get all the write-ups right there, create a job ticket that creates a workflow throughout the shop. Right in here is our production coordination area and as well as our scheduling and um, everything right there. So it all kind of funnels together in a circle from here. This is where everything starts and everything gets laid out. That's where jobs get imposed and you'll be able to start um, seeing how everything gets broken out. But, but um, Actually, and while that's going, that's what we need to get ready for when the files come in. There are several ways that files could come in. I'll let Torrin talk more about this. Torrin oversees our, on our pre-press at nights, and he's pretty much got all the answers I don't. So, <laughs> Well, howdy, first off. Um, well, just like Joel said, pretty much when files come in, we get them a few different ways. We can get them uh, either via an email link, uh, FTP, or uh, some folks like to send us in flash drives or hard drives, whatever they may be. Um, and basically, we pretty much start the process from there. Uh, we prefer to have PDF files. I mean, a little bit easier for us to work with, but uh, native InDesign or Illustrator files are fine as well. Um, it's real basic on how we get things. Uh, basically, there's a there's an email that's pretty much a hub up here where we get all our files in. You guys can come over if you want. But, I mean, it's nothing spectacular. It's just a PC. But all our emails get funneled through here. 
we grab them up and whatever the file on our server, you can access those from any computer here. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to skip a step, and I'm going to go ahead and show you guys our archiving station too. While we're up here, basically, whenever our jobs are done, we have another PC that holds all our uh, all our archive jobs. Put everything we've done, any job that a customer has done, no matter what type of files they may be, we back them up and we put them on these tapes. Okay kind of a little bit old school, but the reason we use tapes is because they hold a lot of information. Okay, we've got a tape drive here that we put those in, and if we ever get a call from a customer saying, okay, well, we want to use the file that we did last year. I'm going to be able to pick him up. Basically, all we do is starts back where okay. Joel said, you get a job number from the client, okay, which is the ticket that represents the job. We go in here, we punch that number in, we tell the, our retrospect software here hey we want this job what it'll do it'll scan through all these tapes and it'll find that job now once it finds the particular tape that the job is on you'll have to insert the tape to the tape drive and then um, that file. basically this is actually one of our files that we've received as an InDesign document um, usually they're already set up um, we usually the only thing we have to do is link the fonts up and then link up all the, the components or the links for the job. Once we do all of that, we go ahead and we just export it into PDFs. And we upload it to our SIPS ripping system. Okay. Which is basically an online proofing system, which is pretty excellent for our clients. Um, lots of times uh, now, which is actually fading away, clients usually ask for us to, uh, after we upload our files into our system, to send them PDFs back of what we sent, what they actually sent to us that's going to print. But now that we have this, um, we can actually just put these pages up there and let the client just check them out from here rather than having to send them back PDFs. They can check it right in their mobile device, huh? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Uh, the, the appropriate rights, they can actually upload them pages themselves. Uh, it automatically pre-flights the files as well once, it, once it's uploaded. So viewing nowadays, once they put it up there, it'll automatically tell them if there's four color black right there, you know, type. It'll automatically tell you if the DPI is under 300 or... Newsprint, we set it probably around 150 or less on the DPI, but uh, most of our heat set and sheet bed work, I believe we can't, any, it notes anything under 300 DPI. The file came in with the RGB and it spots out, it tells them exactly where that's at. So it's one of the new softwares out there that kind of just does that instant. Before, we it had to all be manually done for the pre-flight, correct? Well, Rampage was pretty good at catching those things, but not as... But the client couldn't do Rampage direct. Uh, uh, yeah, no. There was no direct upload as far as Rampage went. That was back when we just got your files, we ripped them and sent them back, as in when I was saying about the PDFs. Are you saying there's no consequences to the designer for a poorly, poorly created file that they send you? <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> Usually a phone call is the worst thing. <laughs> but um, most of the time when a file is, uh, let's say you guys are building a file, Okay. Um, let me go ahead and start from the beginning. The first thing you want to go through with a client, other than if you're building them a magazine or whatever it may be, you need to know the size first. Okay? Size is very important. All right? Especially to us because the minute we get a file and it's the size that it's supposed to be, but it doesn't have what we like to call bleed on there, it's a problem. Okay? Big, big problem. So you guys heed these words. Whenever you get a file or whenever you get a job and a customer says, okay, I want this to be eight and a half by 11 and I want it to be 32 pages, make sure when they say eight and a half, 11, that you being the designer put an eighth of an inch of edge around all these documents. Now I'll show you as an example of what I mean by that. So this document here. 
This is the final size of that. You guys do use Adobe InDesign, correct? Yes. Okay. This is the final size of that. Okay. Now, when I hit W, as you can see along the outside of this, there's a red line. Okay. That red line represents your bleed area. Whenever you have an image and you want that to bleed off the page, it has to go outside, touch that red line, which is an eighth of an inch. Okay? Unless you guys want about <coughs> ten phone calls from me late at night. Um, is let's there see. a charge for that phone call? There should be. Uh, yeah, there should be. <laughs> 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 yeah, for, yeah, first the phone call goes to Joel, and then Joel calls you. Um, Do you ever bill uh, designers for incorrectly set up files? What I mostly do is once they send it, once we receive everything in and we're outputting proofs, if we catch everything and there's something wrong, you know, before um, outputting anything, I'm not going to charge if we didn't do any if we didn't output any um, blue lines or epsons. But once the proofs are actually output, physically go through, and maybe there might be just one page. Usually, well, do, we do have charges for the, um, just per page or, you know, minimums right there. Usually it runs about $10 a page on the blue line to fix it, as long as we're not color correcting. It's just a new PDF that you send us that we could play, um, place right there. We output a new um, DBL, put it on top of our blue line so you can see what changed since the old one, which I'll show you over there um, when we get to that area for the proofing. But other than that, when it comes to color corrections and stuff like that, that's where you see a lot of the charges. Or maybe sometimes um, we'll have the native files. And when we see the native files, we'll go ahead and, um, you know, if we have to make changes and stuff like that, that, can, that takes up Mac time to be able to do. And then I'll put new um, Epson or a DBL to be charges. So what's the incentive, the advantage for a designer putting together files that go right through the system? No problems. Oh. No problems. Yeah. And that's one of the <laughs> things about get, our system slips. <laughs> they actually get an email or a phone call saying, great work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great job. You did it again. Yes. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it, it's a normal thing most of the time for a designer to do something like that. Just because there's always somebody to help you here. Um, obviously, we're 24-7 we're shop, so if there's any type of problem, any type of questions that may occur, you know, just call us up. We're here, and there's always somebody here. One of the professionals can walk you guys through whatever your question may be to get it, uh, to get it corrected. So with this service you provide, which is you know, being around the clock and the software and all that, your printing must cost more. <laughs> To well, <laughs> well <laughs> back to Joel. Has their own niche. When it comes to printing, we're a shop that kind of can do everything, and there's not another shop around here that can. As far as we can do sheet fed, we can do heat set work, we can do cold set work, we can do digital work. We can marry all those together as well. Now, as far as prices, we have some of the newest, most efficient machines. The SIPs, everything here is most efficient, so you should be getting one of the best prices that there are, you know, in the country. The only thing that I could say that if your paper was delivering in New York, you're going to most likely get a better price altogether, you know, on the East Shipping Coast. Will kill you. But yes. yeah, we do produce a lot of nationals worldwide, and especially for the region. Um, but Joe, let right me. Here. I'm going to stop you right there just for a minute, though. But I, I, the one thing I can say about you know Joe saying that, you know some printers being on the East Coast and some people having jobs there. We get still a lot of clients come here from the East Coast yes. just to print their jobs. That's because they want to do the press runs, which means they're going to have to be there. And while they're here, they'll have to go down to the strip. And they, exactly. There you go. Yes. <laughs> that's actually that's a great incentive there. And, I mean, we do have, we have a, quite a few clients from the East Coast that come and spend weeks with us during their publications because we do the color correcting here on site. What do mm -hmm. they do while they're waiting around? Oh, well, yes. <laughs> one client in particular yes. loves the shopping here, so that is one uh, okay. one Emily that she uh, that, that she uh, 
enjoys when she comes out while her job is uh, being fixed, uh, color corrected, and on press. <laughs> well, as far as Regents, um, and talk about price as well, is when it comes to freight and everything, about 60% of our work is probably California, it goes to California. There's, um, they're producing out of state, you know, it's state tax right here is going to be applied when it is manufactured out of state and delivered to through another state. Another thing that's a huge benefit for them is we're not a manufacturing city. All the trucks that come up to Las Vegas deliver everything from LA, Phoenix, they're manufacturing cities. We're not a manufacturing city. They all leave empty trucks. So we get the best rates going back to California. I can tell you there's printers in LA that deliver five miles up the street and their freight charges are more expensive than ours. So that's some of the benefits. There's a lot of benefits of where we're located here. Um, but as far as pre-press, I mean, once the files come in, anything else on that or? Oh, well, no, once, once they come here and we do what we do, they obviously go back here into preps. We can add videos to it, um, you name it. I don't know if you could pull one up just to show everyone. Yeah, this see. is getting very popular with clients. Um, because it's not only that, when you do it, when you have a printed product, nobody can actually do a tracking behind everything. Now we can actually type how much somebody's on the on the digital flip book. There's links to every advertiser on there, so it's just another added value to the clients right there where if they were to click on it, it would um, take you to their site. At the end of the month, we've had clients where, you know, and we showed them, look, 1,200 people went to this advertiser through your site. It actually, it just happened, one of the books that we did was uh, um, a lot of tractors and farm equipment. can't believe it. They get probably 200,000 unique hits a month on their book. And just happened to sit there and show them about their... Um, Look who's looking at your stuff right here, and you can pull stuff, and this is what you need to show your advertisers that this is an ad value you're giving them. Well, come to find out, we were trying to figure out what country this was, and it ended up being, I believe it was Laos or something. Um, and next thing you know, that oh, he took it to his advertiser, and he goes, yeah, they just bought equipment from me like oh, a week later. So, I mean, it was pretty cool to see that. That's how that actually originated. It's a great marketing tool, too, for them. But let me let Torrance show you. It's yeah. kind of real popular. and It's something we do. It's a little different than the CMYK printing. It's the files get converted to RGB, right? Yes, they do. Yeah. And we actually host this site that these uh, books are actually on. Uh, I mean, it's basically just your printed Mac, except you're looking at it on screen. Yeah, now, right. there also, there's some interactives along with it as well. Um, you know, your TOC, you can click on whatever page it is you want to skip to. It'll take you right there. Um, go ahead. How many, how many jobs do you have going on at once? Like you yourself. Uh, usually, I try not to do more than three of them at a time. Um, because lots of times, you know, you'll get some things that are fairly easy, you know, one page switches out, a new job comes in, it may be just, you know, a two-sided piece. I mean, for me now, you know, along with uh, a lot of my associates in here, you know, if we get like a 32-pager, we can get that rolling while we're dealing with, you know, proofing coming out in the other room, you know. So, I mean, we just, we, you have to be able to multitask and you have to be able to, to just keep up with that fast pace. Okay, but a lot of us know the system, you know, rather well to where, you know, we can navigate ourselves through and check what needs to be changed, what check what's been changed, you know, and it's a piece of cake once you get rolling. <laughs> now, along with this, this is Christian Science Monitor. Okay, now I'm not sure how much you guys have dabbled into uh, application development, but um, well, I'll give you a real brief synopsis on that. Christian Science Monitor, see, okay, they do a digital edition as well, as you can see with this. I mean, this is pretty interactive. It has links that t that'll take you to different places and whatnot, but, but with the app development, they do it as if it's, it's on a tablet, and I don't have a tablet with me. I wish I could show you. Um, 
but these things such as let's see here such as this as you can see this is a two-page spread now I'm not sure how much you guys have dabbled in tablets but what we're able to manipulate when they give us these these files here uh, well our tablet files is usually they'll start obviously you know a tablet's what like 10 inches your average tablet you'll get this image this type probably about this much will be at the bottom of it okay they can fix it as if we were scrolling through that type and you can do that on this page you know obviously it's a flip so you have to flip through the book but it has scrolling and it also has interactive there's no movies in this one but the in the app they usually have a section for movie previews and you can actually click on those and they are set to where it goes to a, 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 a hyperlink in YouTube and then you can watch that movie preview from that actual uh, that app which is very interactive it's very cool the first time I actually got involved with it I was like wow this is um, hold, hold it I thought this was a print shop it like is. Paper and ink on that. Like I said, it is. dying and you got to evolve with the times right now. So we're having to, we come up with different marketing strategies, different ways. At the end of the day, we don't grow unless our clients grow. And our clients right now, we have to come into contact with different ways for them to go. Because it's harder to sell actual paper printed books right now with the tablets coming, um, with all the books on the tablets. Smartphones. Anything that you could get on the internet. It's just, you can find it everywhere nowadays. But you still prefer the paper, and we try to make stuff that go along with it interactive, which is really nice about, um, if you have an article in something and you create a digital edition, now you can have an article about an event, but you can actually see if I can pull some of those files up. Net, you know, overnight, and just put it on your digital edition there and have that as a backup. But we just try to find added values for our clients through all different ways. It could be, I mean, you saw the fad of probably the 2D barcodes probably from the last eight years, seven, seven, eight years. One of the newest things coming out right now um, that people are getting into is, what's that, um, 3D, or, uh, is it? real, it's is where it you like take a picture, anything you take a picture of, it will actually try to pick up in, Physically, um, I got it right here actually. It's a augmented, augmented it's called, reality. Yes, AR, augmented reality. So what it is is your everybody's got a, of course, a camera on their phone nowadays. And if you were to go to the front of our building, take a picture of it, it might build, pick up, scan, and take you right to our website. Or it could also sit there and knows where you're automatically at and start pointing you in restaurants all the way around. There's, there's a lot of places on the strip now that I've already got that where you take pictures with your camera on special odd band reality and that's where it's going. Same thing in printing. If you take a little thing on, you know, go over an article right there, it'll take you into the article. There's a comic book we did where I think um, you scan with the AR uh, system right there on your phone and it would start playing the comic book as a little movie right there, the whole comic book instead of reading. I mean, there's all different functions for it. And that's where it's kind of coming. Print's kind of marrying up with a whole bunch of other ways to make it interesting nowadays, too. The other thing is, is like I said, the variable, which um, oh, I think you ever get a chance for a digital shop to come by. That's something else, too. It's Just variable prepare. data where you're actually going one-to-one -one and you're getting something personalized for you in the mail that's making you actually want to look at it. And um, that's becoming real popular. And then we're marrying that up with um, our regular heat set and our static print that we do here. Um, yes? Um, well, that's interactive, like the digital magazine. Oh, there, what's the design I sent to you is the magazine of without the handling and interactive, interactive What do you do for Okay, so what we do is when you send us our PD, when you send us the PDF in, for the we, print job, for the print job, we're taking because you're sending it to a CMYK, mm -hmm. we're taking those same files and retaking them and sending them into RGB because so that way it can be um, viewed on here. Then we have a system and then there's some manual parts to it right there as well. But you go through and it starts setting up the links. We could do a table of contents sheet, design it the way that you want us to, mm -hmm. and then what happens after that is. Once you like your, you know, you get your first issue all done, and we got it the way you want. 
the next time we'll do the same thing and you can have an auto updating link you can have a mini flip book on your email that just sits there turning page i have clients that have a tv when you walk into their office where it's just got their pages of their book just constantly flipping open up their digital editions um and then every time that it gets changed so let's just say um the issue just came out today on stands well the digital edition would be automatically changed you wouldn't even have to change the background we have an auto updating link as well it, will, it would come with a package of probably 20 different links for anything you you say you would have for that digital edition so most of the conversion from the print version that the designer submits to you and the final digital edition of that that you is pretty automated with just a little bit of customizing Did you say yeah just a little bit of customizing goes along with that i mean it also depends on what you as a client what you would like to happen lots of clients like for their uh, um for the ads in their magazine to link straight to the advertiser's website um some folks like for you know if there's an email on there hey if you click on the email link it'll take you straight to that person's email and you can ship them whatever message you want it all depends on what uh, as a client you would like The program that we use for that is called iCloud Mobile Media. Uh, like I said, that's what we actually host at here. Um, and I just lost it. I won't have to go to this lecture next week. Yeah. <laughs> Something not like that. <laughs> But yeah, we just upload, we make, we compile all those pages into a PDF and we basically, we squish them and change them back to RGB, upload them to this, and that's what takes you to that flip book that we were just flipping through, okay? And in that flip book, we can actually, do you see how all these things are highlighted here? We do those manually. OK, um, the system just has this marquee here. You can see it up here in the corner. That little guy. If you wrap him around anything here, he'll automatically make a link. OK, only thing is when he does make a link, you have to direct it right here. But it's easy as that. You know, you just take that whatever the uh, code is for that. Like this right here is linking us to page 12 in the book. OK. You go here. First off, it says to page or website or email. You just select your page, and then you go in there, and that's got all the pages of that publication in it right there. And you just pick whichever one it wants to direct to. So now we can work here. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're ready. Here's my seat. <laughs> Enjoy. Until the next trip. But we'll go ahead, and you want to take them into yeah, preps no now, Any Joe? other questions? Yeah, is there any other questions? Any other we rip things into SIPs, those single pages, after we go through that single page deal of what we like to call a flat plan, which you guys saw that earlier, just all the pages laid out like that. We come in here, and we have what we like to call an imposition view. Okay? Basically what this is, is when we get ready to impose the pages for press. Okay? Now, as Joel will show you guys later, there's several different presses out there. Therefore, that means there's several different layouts. You know, like Joel was saying as well, is, you know, we're one of the printers, we can print anything. We can do anything. Okay? So, any size, any whatever, we can do it. But the thing is, once we have the sizes of all these different jobs, you have to make a template for that particular size job. Okay? So we have dozens upon dozens upon thousands of templates that we have to maintain and keep in our system, in our archives, in order to apply them to certain jobs. Okay? But once we have this layout here, which this is obviously, I think this is actually laid out for our sheet fed press. Once we get this layout, we take that exact file right there, 
send it through one of these guys here, and that's a double-sided BBL machine. So what I mean by that is when, obviously this is cut to shreds, but. So this right here is like a little VP fold or a double parallel fold. fold. Hey, you need to turn that light off over there, Joel, on, for the light table on the bottom. Yeah, see it a little better. So what's happening, you can see the fold marks already on the sheet. All these blue lines, they're called SSI lines. What they do is they... So what we got here is these blue lines are called SSI lines. What they do is just represent your final trim around the sheet and the folds. They will not print on the sheet. That's just so the client can actually see it. Also, when we trim this out, they will go and they'll fold this in half and then half again and that's where, um, what do you call it? That's what we would send to the client to look at the sign off on as a blue line. As far as color, we use the F-tint or we have a Versan. Okay. Uh, so what we have also is called a Versan. It's a digital press that's color uh, coordinated or G7 certified, they call it, with our presses from the, um, the heat set, the sheet set, everything there. And we'll produce color out of that or we also produce what they call an Epson press, which is a true representation from your files of how it should print. But there's a lot of different adversaries that you have when you hit the press. Paper for one, the, the paper's not as bright as what the photos is right there. Especially with that red, you don't want to push too much cyan because then you'll have it turn purple. Uh, but other than that, this is pretty, basically what we do right here is all of our outputting of the DBLs and our Epsons. From here, what we do is they come into signatures. Uh, usually they have a sign-off sheet stapled to them, and they'll be trimmed, and they'll have staples, uh, it's got staples in it, just so, for the client to be able to review. And a lot of times, sometimes they're internal approval, this job is, and if not, we send these actually out to the client, they'll go through, sign on a sign-off sheet, saying maybe page five, we notice the typo. We want to replace a photo on page eight. And they'll send us revised single page PDFs to our FTP site normally. And uh, then send us back the proofs. What we will then do, let's just say photo had a, it, it was spelled wrong. It was spelled without an H, photo. They noticed that. So what we would do is we would output that single sheet. We would actually staple it right here. You'd lift it up, see the photo ad here and the photo ad right here. So even the press, we knew there was a corrected page that they will see it circled for them. It, it lets everybody in our company aware that there was a change on that page and they can see where that change was actually made. So, I mean, so, and then uh, a lot of times what we do is on the proofs too, when the client makes that change, instead of outputting a hard proof and sending it back to them, that we usually repost it back to the FTP site. They'll approve, um, the, they'll approve that one ad right there on the, that single page on the FTP site along with everything else and then you know we're good to go. Sir? How about earlier, all printing is, uh, here is done CMYK. So what you have, here's, here's what we were talking about in Epson proof. This is a color proof right here. So what you're seeing here is a quarter fold and you're just looking, right now we're getting eight pages on the plate. You see the blue lines going around everything? Like I said, those won't print. They're just there to show you, you know, your SSI lines. You're seeing a double eighth inch right here in between. This is a grind. It's going to be a perfect bound book. And uh, on a perfect bound book where they have the glue on the spine right there versus the saddle stitch, we have to take an eighth inch grind on the spine right there and allow for the glue trap and then adhere the cover to it. Perfect bound. It's a grind to spine. Put glue on it. Holds the oh, uh, it. I can, we've done five inch books. Oh. Yeah, you name it. No, well, yeah, I'll show you when we go out there. You're gonna, it's stat, It's not like a saddle stitch. A saddle, everything falls on top, and that's how you impose a job. If you're looking on a 32 pager and we're printing it at two sixteens, your 32, your first form is gonna have one to one through eight, 
and then, or sorry, um, one through four, the other, or I mean, one through eight, and the other one's going to have the 24 uh, through 32. And then the other one would be your center form, so they fall on top of each other. A saddle stitch, they stack on top of each other, go through a clamp, and then I'll show you that whole process. You'll, you'll see them, our binder should be all up and running right there. We have four of them, so you, know, you should go here. This is what they call a gate fold right here, a six page gate. Even though it's not a full page, they still, they gonna call this a six page, four page cover. This is what they would call a six page cover. Other thing too, if you're on any designing, nail panels. You guys work with any kind of mailings, always double check with your printer or the post office because it's always changing where they have to go. If all the permit, all that's done correctly right there, you always want to just double check on that right there that the mail position's okay. Every, I mean, if it was just a self book coming out, every, every kind of different style has a different area you have to put the mail panels. So it's always best just consult with somebody from the U.S. Post Office. You can send us a back cover of what it is. We, can, we have a United States Post Office here on site. We put out more mail than any company in the state of Nevada here at Girl Printing. So, I mean, it's kind of nice every time we got a question or we got stuff that comes in from our clients. We always have to get a sign off with the Post Office. It just helps from anything happening in the future. That's your worst thing is all of a sudden you got something 30 cents, you know, going out for, you know, you're getting a 30 cent book per piece going out and it's going to cost $1.50. Or you're going back to press for $60,000 reprinting the job because it's cheaper than the postage cut difference. So that's, it's scary. It's very scary. So we always we want to double check on any design in our artwork. You do. Man ahead. Plan well, ahead, right? Absolutely. You have to. I mean, that's, we have our processes here, so hopefully nothing ever that has a mail panel or gets mailed goes through without being okayed from our um, a mail representatives here at the company. So, a little bit back to the blue lines, though. So what you're looking at is one side of the plate here. So we would call this plate A. Now, on the other side of the cylinder, so this is only going to print one side of the form on the press when we go out there. Then you're gonna have a plate B on the other underside right there. And then most of our presses are at least double web here. So what you're gonna see is a plate C and D as well. Each one of those are gonna have CMY plate, CMYK. So here's actually there's cyan, magenta, yellow, black. That's your plates right here that create right here. So if you look at this bed set or the right here, you got the sofa set right here. That's actually what compromises, what actually makes up this piece right here. So what you're seeing is all these little dots. Um, what happens is these plates, of course, you know, they don't hit the, um, they don't touch the paper because paper can't touch it. What it hits against is a blanket. And then that blanket is what makes an impression onto the paper. So what happens here is anywhere you see it burned right here, it's actually the solvent can't stick to it. So the solvent can stick to any of this gray area that's, and you'll see how quick the press is going, how quick this does it, but it's, it goes through, it lays a solvent on it. Wherever the solvent sticks to, ink can. And then wherever you see burned right here, the ink gets to stay on. So what you're gonna see right here is how quick it is and how fine of a dot and what represents everything right there to create that color. Because it doesn't take much of one of these other colors to throw something off right here before it's not matched. It's just, these printings came a long way, and it's pretty cool to see how it's done right now compared to the old days of last thing, film and shooting, yeah. Yeah. Speaking shooting of, your film and ruby reds and everything. Yeah, speaking of the long way, that's where these things came into play. You don't have to take a plate and put it under a camera 20 times. Yeah. So what process starts there. Oh, sorry, Joel. Oh, process no. starts there. All the plates are at this higher end of this. This machine holds three different types of plates. Those three different types of plates, obviously, they go with the three presses that we have out there. Um, actually, it's four different types of plates in this one. All your plates are in this. It's at the end here. Basically, this is an elevator. 
takes whatever plate you choose, sends it through here. This is where it gets exposed. Okay. After exposure, it goes through the chemical process here. After the chemical process, it comes out and stacks itself up. I was going to show you guys some dumb. We're actually more around 95, 96 it started coming into play. From black where everyone had to shoot the film right there and burn the plates manually, it's what they call CTP, a computer to plate. So what is happening is, once everything's imposed on those computers, it shoots RSI data to this. And we can pick up some on our newspaper press across town, go around Highland, we do all the pre-press things. All the pre-press things done right here, they automatically go on to a further pick up RSI data and have a plate made over there and they can play all night long for the newspaper press. Uh, but that's basically, I mean, that took out all this hand. If you would have seen what it was, 20 years ago to produce a job, it, we required 15 times the personnel, yeah. and we still couldn't even probably touch a tenth of what we're doing right now. I mean, I had a job probably just the other night come in, it was over 500 some pages. I got all my proof, uh, came in, the next day I had all my proofs sitting right there, and we had our proofreader going through it when I walked in in the morning. I mean, it's amazing how many pages and how quick you can actually process through the proofing. And nowadays, even just going to plate is. So uh, back in the days, of the newspaper companies had their thing. They were the only ones, you know, that were actually, here's your place, run with it right away. No, you know, after everything went. Nowadays, we're able to do it with even um, high-end work. So it's really great. Dot line screens or dots and all of that yet? No, we just mentioned half tones and that's all. Oh, okay. There's a couple of different types of, way, um, of ways the dots, when you're actually looking at a printed piece, you see the way the dots are right there? Those dots, they're stochastic, traditional. What we use is what's called a co-ray. A little bit half between a traditional and a little bit in between what a stochastic dot is. And um, that's just, you can pretty much, if you know what you're looking at, you can tell what printer printed what piece because that's their fingerprint. You can't change the way that they output or dots onto the uh, plates because that's what it turns lays down onto the piece right there. So you can always tell pretty much. It leaves a, everybody has a different way. And line screens are how many you're getting per inch type thing right there. So right now on our webs we're getting around 170, 175 on the co-ray pattern. And um, our loose prints are around 120 which you're, the RJ, you look at the RJ, that's about 80. So we're using ours more like a commercial. Yeah, well, we were up at 130 for a while and it started plugging up a little bit and um, it wasn't going too well with some of the light, light newsprint stock. So 120 ended up working really well. Um, as far as right here, you're seeing each one of those. So what's that? Same exact, it's got like that process exactly going through because what you're seeing, it's got, it's burning all of this at the same time. And it's also then it's washing, it's got the solvents going through it. And then like you said, it kind of rubberizes it right there. And it gums it up. Any questions in here or anything you can think of? How much does each plate cost? What's that? How much does each plate cost? You mean as a blank plate or? That I don't have a clue. I'm not sure what the exact what it would go for. But I think when you buy them, you buy them in large amounts, so I wouldn't know what a per plate is. We're not gonna yeah. sell you one. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't release that kind of information until after your job's been printed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you got a few different things right here. You have gloss UV, matte UV, soft touch, they're all different. So this is a soft touch right here. You can probably feel right here the coating. Right here. So that's just, all it is, it's a protectant right there for the sheet. Gives it a nice shine. But, and then there's usually a doll. And the doll's got more of a waxy feel right there. Uh, um, 
we could get, but like I said, as we do a lot of different type of coatings right here and mix them up, and you'll see that on a lot of covers right there. A lot of high-end books will do a lot of spotting. If we're spotting out this, the back page falls on the same thing. Doesn't cost any more. They could go to their advertisers, have them do something we had them where they have watches or something right there on the back cover. Spot UV that off that soft touch, and it looks like the watch is jumping off the page. I mean, it, it doesn't cost them anything extra, and it's an added value they can sell, or they can upsell their clients either way. So, kind of what we were just looking at that they were folding right here, this book, Glossy View, there's that four page cover inside right there with that perf. So it should be able to pull right out. Put a different code on it for every month that we have, so they got it tracking. And uh, it's just a lot cheaper to print a whole year at a time, and we store it right here for them. So I'm thinking they said, hey, I'm seeing like a hickey or something that's on the piece of paper right here. They're going to be like, we could go back through and go through our press. It could, we could, if it ran through a folder, everything should be time stamped, and we save it for up to three months. That way we can at least try to see how what limitations something finally got out, or just try to see it, you know, um, how, how contained it really was. What, it helps you blame which pressman, right? Yes, definitely. That's when we go to the roll sheets and the operator sheets for that night. As I said, we're moving some equipment. This is half of our press. This is half of our press over on Highland right now. It's what's called a Goss Magnum. It's one of the newest newspaper presses purchased west of the Mississippi in the last five years. Um, each one of these units are four high, so it runs CMYK straight up. You are getting, right here, this way it's configured right now is this is four webs it runs. So it runs four rows at one time now. But when the whole press comes, it would be able, it's going to be able to run up to 12 rolls. Uh, they go back to the mills and capture money back from the mills usually. <laughs> usually that comes back from the mills if it's a claim from them or if it's not else, everything else here gets recycled. But basically, this is what you see at newspaper press. You see LB Weekly around um, Vegas 7. All the interior pages that aren't glossy are produced on these press right here. So those are the ones you see. It's a very high quality. It's not your traditional looking at the RJ. It prints a high line screen, prints very well, and it pulls a lot of paper through this thing. This, this is what you call a Goss Magnum. And this is only half, not even half of it, um, we st this is only one folder. It's going to have three folders. We have eight more to four highs coming over, so that's 32 units of plates right there that, you, that um, it would be going through. How many press to operate that? Um, we treat this as three. We, we're going to treat this as two to three presses. So on each one, just because of how many rolls, you got a roll tender on each side of the press because we're going to have 12 roll stands when it's all up and going where 12 rolls can literally roll through this press at one time. Um, so I would say each press crew is probably about four people. You got about four per crew. And now if it's a tricky job, if it's a high quality job, we're going to put more people on there just to keep that color going right there. Especially if, it's got a, if we're looking at four webs of four color, definitely I need some more people on the color and everything right there as well, and registration table next four weeks we're going to be moving the other half over here and um, add, putting the add-ons onto it as well. Uh, the right here, what you're seeing here is what they call web rolls. So these rolls right here, they weigh anywhere from well over 2,000 pounds and every one of these are either different paper, different size roll and that's what gets put on. These presses do not stop. They when they go, it splices into the next one, and it goes. Just keeps going. You're going to see how fast they go here. Let's go take a look where they're at on the heat set press right now. So this is actually, sorry, newspaper is what they call cold set. The reason why this is called cold set printing, that's like I said, you, you grab a newspaper, you're going to get ink on your hands. When, the, when paper's going through here, we're actually putting water into the paper along with the ink. When the water dries, that's what's causing that ink to try to dry. It never dries fully, but that's what keeps it set in there right there. And because it's not going through anything else, that's what keeps it called cold set because of the, it's more of a water process they use to dry throughout the um, press. But what they got going on, so this is a double web. So what you're having is you have a roll here and a roll here running. 
when this roll runs low on that, I mean down to about a quarter inch of sheet left on that, it splices in the hair and this press will not stop when it goes. It, auto, it just has all these tensioning levers that automatically just keep carrying it through right there. Now, each one of these units has a CMYK. We have eight, unit, we have eight units right here. So it's printing both sides on each one of these units. So you have four units CMYK for one web, CMYK for the second web. So this is all that, what they're doing right now is they're pulling up on the job. You're seeing the colors as it comes. Looks like scummy pies, you see all that? They're putting press wash drill, barn cleaning a plate, you know, getting all that going. 800 sheets before they got a good one to save. Really? That's why the sheet bed is a different, these are for large runs. Um, you can run thinner paper on. That's why sheet bed is more efficient for smaller runs. So that, anything 5,000 or less is going to go on a sheet bed. Over here, anything that's probably about 5,000, 10,000. It all depends on page counts too. A lot of variables. But that's what you're looking at right here. So what's that? All your meat. Yep. Pumps up to every single... So what it does is, is they pump into everything right here. So that's going to get CMYKs right here. And everything pumps up right here. We actually have an ink house here on site that services Arizona and parts of California from our site. So this is what they call a blanket. It's not like the blankets back in the days they actually had to wrap them. These are cylinder blankets. What happens is, like I said, the, that plate does not touch um, any, any of the paper. It's actually touching this blanket, and wherever that solvent doesn't go, where the ink picks up, it lays an impression on this blanket. This blanket is what touches the sheet and lays it over. So each one of these, and they all register in hand right here. So what you're seeing, we'll go over here and take a little closer look. Just kind of watch out, touching anything right here, and it does get all over. So kind of watch out right over here. A little bit of ink and stuff. So if you look, you actually see the plate, you can actually see the plate right here running. So you see the plate and then the blankets are underneath it. So that's how quick it's actually going and registering like that. This is the upper web. Now we have four units and the lower web going through that through the bottom dryer. These are your big ovens. They're, they're out on the full plate going down. Signature at the end. Well, it should be coming out already folded off the end. Just double check how it's flipped up. Is that the breathe the air in? Well, yeah, all this stuff has afterburners on it. For yeah. It's not good if our afterburners go down, yeah, it would be really it's bad. It's been around for hundreds of years. So right, right here are the ovens that we talked about. This is what makes this a heat set press. From the files, it automatically sends inky data to our press. And the inky data right there automatically tries to pull up on press where the color value should be for each one. So each one of these are what's called an ink key. So when you're looking at something like this, the keys would run all up like this. So he's trying to set, he goes through, once it's pulled up, he's going to add a little red here, add a, you know, pull down a little cyan. That's what he's doing right there. The other thing they're doing is um, dropping water and registration, trying to get that all correct too during each run. Any questions right here? Change as it goes. Yeah, it takes uh, a couple of minutes and it pulls the values over there, adds a little, uh, add a little over there on that, whatever unit he chooses. It takes a little bit, and then by the time it comes out over here, he'll go. A few minutes later, he'll grab another one and take he'll take a look at the values. What you see here, these are different flavors on the press. So, like you saw, there was a job that had four covers on it. I could actually fold four covers coming out right here, two separate ones even coming out in a row. It's what they call a PFS system. 
Uh, that's what we're looking at here. It's just a different type of food off of the press. Right here would be a sheeter unit, so if it were to come off as a sheet, it would come off right here. We then both like, go to our bindery to get folded or um, UV code or however we do that as well. So this is a PCC uh, section right here. When it's coming right here, this is actually coming off of the 32 page. And then what they're doing here right here is they're lying and it's going to strap it up. Then they're going to put it down on a skid. And uh, then it, you see all, what we call a log. And that's what goes to our uh, binder right there. So you see it going right there. So that's just the way that it's easy to get handled. We have machines in our bindery that pick these up like this so you don't have to pick them up by hand. That's all waste. That's all. Yeah, they're not. They're not saving any copies yet. Their stuff. They're still saving. It's all part of the make ready right now. So what you're seeing, just like we saw in the folder, half fold, half fold, half fold to make a 16. But now we're doing it with two rubs. So we got 32 pages coming out already folded, and this will go right to our. Per uh, actually, we don't see a perf here. We know it's going to a saddle stitcher. So you know right here, this is going to go back and it's actually going to get stapled right here. It's, uh, it's a different things, we just skip back different ways, but most of our stuff that goes to the perfect binders and everything gets logged. Thousand missiles, the other Sunday presses do. Then we're having a lot of construction here. This is where we're going to have a 57 inch press. There's only one other 57 inch press on the west coast that's owned by Quad Printing. But this one's going to have different bells and whistles. It's going to look like make these look like a midget. When this one's done, it's going to make that look like a midget. So it's. It, it's going to be pretty cool. That, that should be up and running hopefully by August. They just laid down all the floor there. I have a question. Yeah. When do those guys know that they're actually doing a good run? Oh, they're going to be yelling. They talk to each other. They got, oh, okay. they got their own kind of sign. They got their own made up okay. hand signals over there. So this is a perfect binder. It's what makes one of these books with the glue. Um, let me find one that's actually running though. We'll go over the one that's actually running right now. You'll be able to see a lot. Look, it's trims here, here, and here. All that waste gets sucked up there. We have balers. We probably kick out of about a 2,000 pound bale when we're running solid about every 10 minutes. Well, um, everything here is full recycled. We are an FSC tri-certified facility here. We are very much uh, tri- make trees as we consume. We also uh, feed back too and we do the sustainability and mills that only, the paper mills that only do too. So that's one of the only things that here that we really do preach. As far as like our emissions, our ink are made out of soy ink, all of that. So I mean, everything here we try to go as green as we can and produce a good book. So this is actually a side glue, which goes on the very side of the book that it puts oh. to prevent the the, uh, yeah. the first page of the text not to fall out. So it automatically sucks it up. It'll go in the oh, machine. It yeah. does suck it up. Yep. So here we go over here. We got, so right here, two more perfect binders. They're not running right now. Are you saying 
Perfect, perfect binders. That just means right here where they saw. Correct. Correct. So that's what you call a perfect bound book. Oh. Yeah, it's just what you have to do. No, yeah, they're gonna call Colbus machines oh. right here. Colbus binders. So um, basically it's all saddle stitch. There's a book you guys might have seen, Vegas 7. So what you're seeing here is a saddle stitch book. The difference on the saddle stitch, like I said, is you don't have the perf here, because so, it's not going to grind it. You do have a lap though. The machine requires a lap for it to open up. Falls on the saddle. Next one falls on. And so on and so on. Then you have a cover. Comes out. Comes right there. You're going to see these. There's some heads over here that are moving right there. Those heads, once it's collated, are putting the staples in the book. Then you see this thing going up and down right here. That's a yoke. It's three knives. That knife is taking a, what they call, actually let me show you, a face and a foot trim. So that's what it's doing right there. It's taking all that, sucking it up to the barrel all the way. So you can see that that yoke arm is going right there. And that's what, gives, that's what gives you your book. Yeah. So that gives you a finished book right there. And like I said, this is our... This, so yeah, oh, this was our newspaper press. This was one of our gloss, our um, heat set presses that produced the gloss. So this right here, and here's another thing that's good. You, go look at an LV Weekly or a Vegas 7 in a couple days. You're going to notice this is a little bit bigger, the gloss, and then this is it. What happens is, remember, we got two processes, heat set, cold set. He said we take out all the water out of the book because it's going through the dryers. Cold said we put water in it. It's what's called web growth. In about in another day or two, this is going to sit over an eighth of an inch taller up here and here because get, the water gets in the grain of the paper and causes paper growth. Well, the cold said you got water in something, what happens when it goes away? It shrinks. So that's what's happening. It's called web growth. So, you want to look on the weekly, uh, Las Vegas Weekly or Vegas 7, just take a look at the top and you'll see what, what pages are gloss and what aren't. The gloss are going to stick about an eighth of an inch taller. I mean, for a sheet, because if I were to let stuff dry and everything and go through time, I can minimize that quite a bit. But because usually what we're doing is wet, hot, when they say hot off the press, that's what's happening, hot off the press. What's that? Web says, Yeah, yeah, all this would be web. Okay. All this would be web. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the yoke, and then all the waste is coming right down here from it too. Any questions over here? Anything you think of? The other thing we do here, like I said, we have a DP department, data processing, anything that they have right here, they'll shoot out to these machines. We do inline ink jetting. We'll place ink units right here and actually run um, everything here so we don't do it offline. It's, most printers have, do it. They got to send it to a mail house and do it. We do it all online. So we'll actually break everything here off of our bundlers and tell them how to sort everything for the post office. So do you guys do small jobs? Like, I know some printers do like wedding yeah. invitations and stuff like that. That'd be our digital. Uh -oh. That's where digital went nowadays. You don't got to use the plate. Just like business cards. Yeah. You go get a thousand business cards for 15 bucks nowadays. Right. My plates cost more. One plate costs more than that probably. I guarantee you. And on top of that, you're going to need four plates for four color probably. And then you, you know, the way. So nowadays you got digital printing, you send it right there, no plates, it comes right out. That's how most of all of it's getting, being done right now. Up on the sheet, and you got two impressions of each of them, that's how they make their money. They wait till they fill, fill up a whole sheet. That's their niche. Here we're, we're not that type of printer. 
this is a perfect binder. Our pack machine it kind of puts a thick plastic around some. But what you got here is instead of the saddle stitcher, these pockets are feeding and laying stuff on top of each other. So what it does is it's going to feed over here. And this is all the inside forms. Then it wraps around the cover around the outside. Sit before it gets chomped by the cu uh, cutting blades. But, uh, we'll come on over here. I'll show you get a lot better view than right over here. We'll come around right here. Just kind of keep an eye on everything right here because we do have blades and stuff over here. So. All it is, like I said, is you're correlating everything right here. So it's got only the inside pages coming in right here. It's gathering all these inside pages. You see it coming around right here? Now it's going into a clamp. So this clamp right here is grinding that eighth inch truss fine. Remember how we said there's a clamp and it takes that eighth of an inch? It's grinding it right here. Right here is where you're actually applying the glue on. So it's applying glue right here, that side glue, which is... You see like there's a score here and there's glue here. So that inside page doesn't fall out, that's the side glue. The glue policy saw. This is your perfect ground glue coming in right here on the roller. And that's basically all it's doing here is applying glue to the text. The other side's the cool side. Let's go over. Give it a quick tour. This one. Just be careful right here. So this is the cover right here that's getting applied. It's laying down four perfs right now. It lays down this perf here for the glue trap. It lays down two perfs here on the spine. I mean not perfs, I mean scores. And a score here. Just so that page does not fall out. And same with the back page. When it grinds it, that's where it traps it, and that way that book doesn't go right there, and the pages won't pop out. Once it puts that down, once it's laying down those scores, and the scores keep the paper from cracking. That's what all it is, is putting pressure to the pulp right there, and it keeps it all right there. You can see it actually attaching onto a book right here. You see it pinching it right here? Yeah. Turns around pinches it. Basically, now with a book like this, right outside this, and so you got everything here just waiting for that. This is an eighth inch head trim, quarter inch face trim, and an eighth of an inch foot trim right here. So what it's going to do is now the machine's got all these books coming and you saw a big merry-go-round. That's allowing time for this. What it does from here is it will trip, stacks about four books at a time and it has a, a blade just come down and take all of it off. It doesn't like jam up or anything? Nope. Like a paper cutter? Yeah, yeah, it's just like the guillotine cover, but it's got three sides to it right there. We have the United States Post Office in that second door right there. And I said we do more mail here than any company in the state of Nevada. So they gave us our own postmaster here, or a postal person here on site. We go through with questions. Plus, we got our own thing at Sunset, the big um, post office on Sunset. We have our own little truck entrance and everything right there for us to go back and forth all the time. So right here, mostly what you're going to see in this area, this is our mailing area. All of our machines are pretty much capable of doing mailing, but if, it, if it's too small of a run, something else, or maybe it doesn't fit the saddle stitch or it's a forward job, we're going to bring it here and do the mailing offline. Um, these are poly baggers. They put like shrink wrap around the books right there. They're a poly, so you know, um, this protects the book. You don't have to put inkjet or so you know, like 100% mail verification tables so all we can do is prove that we did your mail but go to the post office it's up to the post office after that so it actually leaves little QR codes on, on the labels you tell us the name we can go look it up and it actually shows the picture of when it was done the time it was done and everything
Oh, I'm kind of on a fulfillment area right now. We're still growing on our fulfillment. Um, we're going to be moving this into our, our newspaper plant as well, a big fulfillment area. So a lot of this stuff might have kits where certain books go to certain people that order them, or maybe it's like two books. The next person might have five or six. So that's what they're doing is going through a list and getting all that ready for postal. Is there more of what they would do on the fulfillment end? Well, pretty much the end here in the shop. Any questions while we're out here?